I know silicates. You know silicates. We all know silicates. Yes, that is a low-hanging fruit joke, but that doesn't mean I can't make it. As we start into Roman numeral 8, I know silicates. In the textbook, this is pages 446 to 456. And then the systematic mineralogy part is 505 to 519. The inosilicates are really the chain gang. And what I mean by that is that there are two different styles. One with a single chain of tetrahedron and the second with two. It's called the double chain. So we're going to go and talk about these in the next two lectures. In the single chain, how I want you to draw this and then to think about the structure, is we get kind of like the C-axis propagated in this direction and the tetrahedron are arranged accordingly. I can go on infinitely in this direction or in this direction. And the double chain are pretty similar in that there are just two of those chains and they end up touching to create uh, ring structures. So if we draw it like this, we get tetrahedra touching and then the next set of teacher and tetrahedra point away from one another and then the next set touch again. Okay, and then this structure can keep going indefinitely in either direction. And these two structures end up creating different chemical formulas or, or ratios of silica to oxygen, where the single chain goes one silica for every three oxygens, but with the exception of N-cytate, they're actually all two to six, so Si2O6. And with the double chains, the base ratio is four silicons to 11 oxygens, but what is actually seen is 822 in all the different chemical formulas. Now one of the other aspects of the inosilicates is that they are all really similar. And so for your notes, I just want you to put that characteristics, characteristics are similar. They're similar within the single chains, they're sing singular within the double chains, and then even the single chains and double chains are similar to one another. And this, I mean like their colors are the same, their lusters are the same, their uh, crystal symmetries are the same, their cleavages are the same, and so it takes a little bit of nuance to actually tr identify these different groups. And so the first group is the single chains, and what we actually call the single chains in practice is we call them the pyroxene group. All right, and the pyroxene group is the single chain. All right, so let's put that in there for uh, clarity. These are the single chains, and they have a general formula. This is how we're going to structure these. We'll do the systematic mineralogy part last. The general formula of the pyroxenes is X, Y, Si2O6, where X and Y, these are cations that sum to 4+. plus. So, for example, it could be calcium and magnesium in a solid solution in X and Y. Or if it's sodium 1 plus, it could also be aluminum 3 plus. We could also have two irons thrown in there. Anyways, these are the types of cations that sit in that X and Y spot, the cation octahedral spots of the structure. The next thing I want to do is I want to plot these, these general formulas, on a discrimination diagram. That is a quadra, how do you spell that? It's an I there, quadrilateral. This is called the pyroxene quadrilateral. And what the quadrilene, <laughs> easy for me to say, the pyroxene quadrilateral looks like is this. And the reason why it's called a quadrilateral is because like this part up here is kind of not included. Although there are pyroxenes that plot up here and will last tonight. But most of the time when you see this in the textbook, it's just this bottom shape, which has four sides, hence the name quadrilateral. And what we do is we use the, this quadrilateral to name the pyroxenes and show the solid solution between the end members. Where if we have magnesium filling both the X and the Y spots, it's the end member called enstatite. And if we have iron filling it, it's ferrocylite. But there's a lot of other ways to fill that X and Y spots, and that's how we get these different names. Diopside and augite and enstatite are really important ones that we're going to talk about here today. So we name the pyroxenes based on their solid solution. And so this is the one of the first things you should do when you're trying to figure out what pyroxene we're talking about is. Go look at it in the framework of the quadrilateral. Now next up 
on our discussion of the pyroxenes in general is I'd like to introduce you to the idea of the pyroxenes I-beam. We're going to put that in quotation marks for now because I need to show you why we call it the I-beam structure. This will take a little bit of time to go through these drawings. So the first thing to do is we're going to draw the single chain like we've done. And then, but we're also going to put in some cations this time. So the general structure is like this, right? And it continues on in, in the two directions with the C-axis going parallel to these lines. And these are our tetrahedrons. I'll put it with a T. But there are also cations. And the cations, the X and the Y cations, can sit in a variety of different places. And there's one spot called the M1 site that ends up being this, it's not really an octahedron. It's kind of like a polygon. It's a but it's trying to be an octahedron. So I'm just kind of drawing it in here as a square in blue. These are the M1 sites. And we can think of that as like holding, let's say, the X cation. Then there's another spot in the st structure that sits here kind of at the tips of each of the triangles. And this is another octahedral spot. And this is our M2 site. And we can think of it as maybe where the Y cation sits. All right, that's the general structure, and what it does is it creates for us a TOT structure because, because sitting down here, there'll be another uh, line of tetrahedra. Anyways, so here's our T's and here's our O's. And if we were to take this view and flip it so that this arrow right here is now coming straight out of the screen, right at your face, and it looks like a little arrow, there it is. This is the C axis, and it's now coming out at your face. How could we draw this? Well, what we would see is a tetrahedron in the front and then a tetrahedron in the back. And so this is what we're going to draw next. We're going to draw two tetrahedrons as triangles pointing down towards the CX. One is in the front. It's this one right here. And then the next one behind it is right here. So that one sits here in the back. I'll put a B. And down here where we haven't drawn another one, there would definitely be another string of tetrahedrons where there's one here in the front from our current perspective and one in the back. So here's our front and here's our back. And in between these two sets of tetrahedron is the octahedral layer with the M1 sites and the M2 sites. And so that gives us the structure of a TOT that goes on in very long, almost infinite directions into the screen and out of the screen right towards you. And this structure right here is the reason for the name I-beam, because if we were to trace on the outside of it, we could visualize this shape right here. And this shape is our I-beam. And how most of the time people in textbooks or like they look at things, even with a transmission electron microscope, we can see uh, or draw this I-beam structure. And it's this I-beam structure that allows us to get to number four, which is very important in the pyroxenes, which is how the cleavage angles in the pyroxenes work. And what ends up happening is that the cleavage occur or intersect with one another at 90 degrees. So we're going to say 90 degree intersections. Now, in reality, it's actually 87, 93, but we can't see that much detail. And so with our naked eye, we just call it a 90 degree intersection. And the reason why it happens is because the weakest part of the pyroxene structure is through, through the cations. The weakest part of the structure is through the cations, so it'll break through the cations. So if we were to draw a bunch of I-beams in the way that they stack together, this is what we would draw. We would draw one I-beam, and then here's another I-beam. It's getting a little sloppy. You can draw your I-beams nice and crisp on your sheets of paper. And then let's put another I-beam in right here. And if the cat if the cations are the weakest part, that's this part. So what will end up happening is that when this mineral breaks, it's going to break along planes that go through those centers. And it's through those centers that ends up being just about 90 degrees the direction. So that's why the structure controls the cleavage. Now to finish up, Oh, let me just go ahead and th throw this picture in from the textbook just to kind of summarize the drawings that we were trying to make. You can pause it here if these would be helpful to make um, your drawings a little more clean. And then the last thing I do want you to do is go ahead and draw this into your notes because the cleavage controls the appearance of these crystals. And so what ends up happening is they tend to be blocky prisms. 
blocky prisms with cleavage. That would be one of the things that I'd want you to picture in your mind when you're trying to identify any of the pyrrhic scenes. And what you might see outwardly when it, it breaks is a stepwise pattern to the outsides of the blocky cleavages where we get here are intersecting 90 degrees that are forming steps. That's a tip for identification. Now to finish off our discussion of the pyrrhic scenes, what I want to do is go to number five and we're going to briefly go through each of the species. And so we'll start off with by far the most common. It's called augite. Sometimes you'll see it called CPX. And what CPX stands for is clino and all of those names are fine for the purpose of this class to be used interchangeably. Clinopyrexine is a bit of a mouthful. CPX is quick to write. Augite is also fine just to say or write. The chemical formula for augite is CAMGFE in a solid solution, Si2O6. And almost all the criteria we discussed earlier about the pyrexines applies. It's a blocky prismatic crystal with 90 degree cleavages. And this one tends to be black because the iron makes it so. And in terms of its geologic occurrence, it is a very common, we're going to put that down, very common rock forming mineral in, um, in igneous and metamorphic rocks. I got some pictures for you before we move on to the next. Here's some examples of augite showing for you. Uh, this isn't the picture I wanted to show you here. This is the picture I wanted to show you of the cleavage from earlier. I can handle this error. This is a thin section view of, a, of an augite crystal. And here we can see, bam, bam, that's a 90 degree angle. And here, that's almost a 90 degree. And so by looking at where the cleavages intersect in this thin section, we can see the 90 degree. Now, outwardly, we're going to see it in hand sample with this stepping pattern. And if those steps are at 90 degrees, then we're dealing with uh, pyroxene, perhaps like object. Now the picture I actually wanted to show you here was just some good examples of black, blocky, prismatic object. Here's a loose crystal, and here is some object sitting in a volcanic rock, a type of rock that definitely you should expect to find object in. Now we should move on and go through the last few. B is going to be diopside. The chemical formula di for diopside is almost the same. We just lose the iron. So it's CAMGSI2O6. And when we lose the iron, we lose their ability to stain the mineral black. And so we are going to look for greenish crystals. A variety of different hues of green should be what's expected here with diopside. If I insert a picture showing diopside, you should be immediately struck by the beautiful green color. And here we see these blocky prisms. If we look closer, we'd see 90 degree cleavages. In this example, we have diopside sitting inside of a marble. And the grains are actually more anhedral. And this draws one point that I want to point out is that it can be confused with olivine. So that would be something I'd want you to work on, how you can figure out that it's, the mineral is not olivine. And the other thing is the type of rock it's in, it's either in the mantle or it's in marbles. So it's an important rock forming mineral in marbles or mantle rocks. That's where you should expect to find diopside. Now C, next up on the list, is spodumene. Spodumene is by far the rarest of these that we're going to look into, but it's important because it's a major ore of lithium. So it's L-I-A-L-S-I-2-O-6. Spodumene looks to me like petrified wood. So this picture here summarizes spodumene, I think, in some really nice ways. There's, It tends to be light colored. So we see a nice mineral specimen of light colored white spodumene here on the left. And it tends to have this kind of splintery, elongated look. And I do want to, that makes it to me look like petrified wood. So we're going to say a splintery cleavage or splintery cleavage fragments. Maybe we'll say something like that. The geologic occurrence of spodumene is in pegmatite. So here we see some miners working on a pegmatite. I don't know where in the world, but in the picture we see these stunningly huge crystals of spodumene. And so that's one thing I want you to know is that the geologic occurrence is in pegmatites. 
oftentimes with other lithium minerals like our lilac colored phyllosilicate, what was the name of that? Oh yeah, lipidolite. They may occur together. And if it's in a high enough abundance, and this can be a major ore of lithium, although ocean brines tend to be a bigger source today. There's spodumene. Read more about it in the textbook if you'd like. And finally, to wrap up this little lecture, we're going to go into enstatite. Now, enstatite has a couple different names that will all be acceptable. If you want to, you can call enstatite OPX. And OPX is short for orthopyroxene. All these pyroxenes we talked about before were monoclinic, but enzatite is not. Enzatite is orthorhombic, and so it has the name orthopyroxene. Now, sometimes enzatite is also called bronzite. And the reason why, at least for the purposes of this class, we're going to always have our enzatite have an interesting luster, kind of a vitreous to pearly luster, which is really unusual for a opaque mineral like this. But it tends to almost be kind of this bronzy metallic look. So let's put something like this. It has a it has a unique luster that makes it look somewhat like bronze. And color-wise, it's going to be browns. Oh, and why is it browns or blacks? Well, we got to put the chemical formula down. The chemical formula is MgSiO3. If you want to think about it in the other way, it'd be Mg2Si2O6. But since you can divide all those by three or by two, it, it, it simplifies. And this is the chemical formula I want you to learn. Now, if we substitute a little iron in with solid solution, at like the PPM level, this browny bronze color goes to black. And then it becomes almost impossible to tell it apart in hand sample from augite. But for this class, I'm only going to give you samples that are brown, bronze to uh, browning color to, to help with the identification. Now it's a very, oh well, let's put another t uh, type of luster, kind of a silky luster you can almost imagine across this as well. Encetite OPX is very common in many different rocks. It is a rock forming mineral in mantle, igneous, and metamorphic rocks. So it's a mineral that we should expect to see a lot as we move forward and learn more about rocks through petrology.